Today's episode is brought to you by Clark's. Clark's story begins almost 200 years ago when Cyrus and James Clark made a slipper from sheepskin. At the time, it was groundbreaking, a combination of invention and craftsmanship that's remained at the heart of what Clark's does. From the very beginning, Clark's has always thought differently. Brilliant ideas are what set Clark's apart. We are teaming up with Clark's and Podgo to bring you up to 30% off on selected items, including the iconic Clark's Desert Boot, by going to podgo.co forward slash Clark's. That's podgo, P-O-D-G-O dot co forward slash Clark's. Hi guys, just to let you know that I have a promo of another podcast that I would love for you to listen to playing at the very end of this episode, so please stay tuned until then. Hi m ms welcome back to another episode of Murder and More. As always, I am your host, Kira. They say your teenage years are the best years of your life. You begin to make long-term friendships, and these friends become an important fixture in your life. You start going to parties, and school either becomes more or less of a priority. You get your first ever job, you learn how to drive and buy your first car with your savings. You start to develop an interest in the opposite or same sex. Your personality blossoms, you learn more about yourself every day and you develop independence and a sense of identity. Whilst most teenagers develop mentally and physically, others get lost and lose direction in their life. Brianna Maitland was born on the 8th of October 1986 to Bruce and Kelly Maitland in Burlington. She had an older brother and the family lived on a farm in East Franklin, Vermont, not far from the Canadian border. Brianna, who preferred to be called Brie, was described by friends and family as a beautiful girl who had a big, caring heart, was compassionate and always put others before herself. Her mum, Kelly, told the documentary series, Disappeared. She would stop for a hitchhiker, even against my advice, and yet one day, I came home from work, and she had picked up a hitchhiker. A young teenage boy, and there he was, in my living room, waiting to get a ride to go somewhere else. But she was a person of compassion. Kelly told WND. Besides books, she loved the outdoors, music, and dancing and she was highly skilled in the martial art of jiu-jitsu. Having taken several years of training, she didn't grow up with a television in the house, so she loved works of the imagination that held meaningful lessons about life. Her father, Bruce, told them, In October 2003, at the age of 17, Brianna moved out of her family home in East Franklin, wanting more freedom than her parents would allow her. Her mother, Kelly, said, We went through the usual teenage conflicts. Brianna is strong-willed, and she was getting more and more independent. Brianna was a highly social teenager who was gaining her independence and wanted to be closer to her friends who lived 15 miles away and attended a different high school. One of Brianna's friends, Shauna Labelle, understood why Brianna wanted to move away from home. Brianna didn't have a lot of friends. Not a lot of people really understood her or gave her a chance. High school kids are cruel. You get judged so easily based upon how you act or dress or what you drive. Brie didn't always have the best of everything. She was always worried about her looks or her reputation or how good she was doing in school, but it didn't ever seem to turn out the way she wanted it to. 
Rihanna moved in with a friend near the new high school she'd enrolled at. However, this arrangement didn't last long, and by December, Brianna was bouncing from house to house and living with two different boyfriends and their families. In late February 2004, Brianna dropped out of high school and moved in with her childhood friend, Gillian, in Sheldon, Vermont. She finally felt settled and joined the high school equivalency programme, hoping this was a fresh start. On Friday the 19th of March 2004, Brianna met up with her mum, Kelly, for breakfast before her high school equivalency exam. After her exam, the pair met back up and went shopping, one of Brianna's favourite pastimes. Her mum stated, Brianna could go to a clothes store and pick out the latest avant-garde fashion, put it on, come out, model, and it would be show-stopping. At one of the stores they went into, Brianna and her mum were waiting in the queue to pay when something outside of the shop caught her attention. She left Kelly in the line and left the store. However, Kelly was unable to see what caught Brianna's eye or where she went when she left the store. Kelly paid for the items and met Brianna back at the car. However, Brianna's mood had changed and Kelly noted that she seemed visibly shaken and agitated and recalls that Brianna was desperate to get home. Kelly decided it was best not to ask Brianna what had happened and dropped her back at Gillian's house and said goodbye to her daughter. At around half past three that afternoon, Brianna got ready for her afternoon shift as a dishwasher at a local restaurant, the Black Lantern in Montgomery, Vermont. She left a note for Gillian, telling her she'll be home when her shift is over. At twenty past eleven that evening, Brianna's uneventful but busy shift was over. The kitchen was clean and the staff clocked out for the night. Some of Brianna's colleagues stayed to chat and have dinner. However, Brianna didn't hang around and told them she needed to get home to sleep and she had another shift at her second job the next morning. Her co-workers watched as Brianna drove away from the restaurant, unknowingly being the last known people to see Brianna Maitland. When Gillian arrived home that evening, she saw the note from Brianna, however left shortly after to spend the weekend away. When she returned two days later, on Sunday the 21st, she was surprised to see the note still on the side and no sign of Brianna. However, she assumed that maybe Brianna had gone to spend time with her family or maybe another friend and besides, there was nothing to indicate that anything was wrong. As the days passed and there was still no sign of Brianna, Gillian grew more and more concerned and on Tuesday the 23rd, she phoned Brianna's parents and asked if she was with them. Quickly, both realised they assumed Brianna was with the other, and as Kelly rang round Brianna's friends, boyfriends and co-workers, and discovered that her daughter hadn't been seen for days, her concern mounted. The following day, Kelly phoned 911 to report Brianna as a missing person, and started driving routes Brianna frequented, hoping to find something that would lead to her daughter's whereabouts. The following day, on Thursday the 24th, Kelly and Bruce went to the local police station to drop off some pictures of Brianna, where police asked what car Brianna had been driving when she disappeared. When they told the officers that Brianna owned a pale green four-door 1985 Oldsmobile Delta sedan, the officers pulled out a photo of a car that had been found abandoned the previous Saturday, the day after Brianna vanished. Their hearts sank as they realised this was Brianna's car. Kelly's mum recalls the moment. Immediately I got chills. My knees turned to jello and I thought I was going to vomit and lose it. At 20 past one the previous Saturday, a state trooper had been dispatched to an abandoned car on Route 118, about a mile from the Black Lantern. The car had been backed into an abandoned farmhouse known as Old Dutchman Barn. However, the state trooper found no evidence of damage to either the car or the house. He investigated the scene, however didn't see anything alarming, other than two unopened paychecks addressed to Brianna and assumed the car had been left by a drunk driver. He headed over to the Black Lantern, but it was closed, and he was subsequently called away on more important business. A towing company removed the vehicle and took it to a local auto shop, 
hoping the owner would claim it once they'd sobered up. When the family learned of these events, they headed to the auto shop to look at the car for themselves. Inside, they found the two unopened paychecks, contact lenses and migraine medication, items they're sure Brianna wouldn't have left behind. Bruce tentatively used a crowbar to open the boot, praying he wasn't going to find his daughter inside. When the boot revealed itself to be empty, Bruce was relieved. However, this raised more questions. Where was Brianna? Had she run away? Or had she been abducted? By Friday the 26th, friends and family were all pitching in to help find Brianna. Missing person posters were handed out and put up around the neighbourhood and Bruce went back to the Black Lantern and questioned everyone that worked there. Meanwhile, police deployed canine search units to the farmhouse where Brianna's car was found and the fields surrounding it. However, nothing was found. The following Tuesday, the 30th of March, Brianna's car was examined for any evidence that might indicate what happened to her. However, all police will reveal is that they found nothing to indicate foul play. While Brianna's car was being examined, her parents received a call from the family of Maura Murray, who had disappeared five weeks before Brianna. Maura's car was found, abandoned, 90 miles away from Brianna's, under similar circumstances. The police investigated the theory, however police and the FBI later revealed that they believe there's no connection between the two disappearances. Two weeks after Brianna was last seen, a national search group dedicated to finding missing juveniles began helping the family and on the 3rd, 4th and 5th of April, more than 500 volunteers canvassed a five-mile radius around the abandoned farmhouse. Despite the extensive search, nothing was found. However, the widespread publicity finally paid off when witnesses who had seen Brianna's car the night she disappeared began coming forward. The first known sighting of the car was sometime between 11.30 and 12.30, when a man driving past noticed that the vehicle's headlights were on, but no one appeared to be inside or around the vehicle. The next witness drove past sometime between 12 and 12.30 a.m. and noticed the indicators were blinking. The final known witness was one of Brianna's ex-boyfriends who drove past the scene at roughly 4am on his way home from a night of partying. He reported that no one appeared to be with the vehicle and left. On Saturday morning, two separate motorists found the scene so bizarre they stopped to take pictures. Unbeknownst to them at the time, these pictures would become extremely valuable to investigators as the state trooper that would later respond to the scene failed to take any photos. One of the witnesses informed police of some items that were left on the ground a few feet from the car. Loose change, a water bottle and either a necklace or a bracelet. Police weren't sure what to make of this evidence, but they were sure of one thing. This wasn't a driving under the influence incident. Friends of Brianna's revealed that about a month before she disappeared, Brianna had attended a party with some friends from her new high school. They recalled that Brianna had got the attention of one of the men at the party, which made one of her friends, Keely Lacrosse, jealous and angry. To defuse the situation, Brianna went outside and sat in her boyfriend's truck. Whilst she was waiting for her boyfriend to come out and drive them home, Keely came out of the house and confronted Brianna. Brianna rolled down the window and Keely then punched her in the face, leaving her with a broken nose and a concussion. Once Brianna had been treated at the hospital for facial cuts and two black eyes, at the encouragement of a friend, Brianna went to the Vermont State Police to file a complaint against Keely. On the 9th of April 2004, the district attorney dropped the assault complaint against Keely despite Brianna's parents' objection, and she was cleared of any involvement in Brianna's disappearance. In mid-April 2004, rumours began to circulate that Brianna's disappearance was somehow related to illegal drug activity, 
with Vermont experiencing a crack epidemic at the time. Police knew there was a drug ring active in the area in the weeks before Brianna disappeared and wondered if she had crossed paths with known drug dealers at a party she had attended where hard drugs were known to be present. While people believe that she may have come into contact with drug dealers at one of these parties, Brianna's friends dispute the idea that she was a hard drug user, with her childhood friend Gillian stating that Brianna was a recreational user only. Four weeks after Brianna's disappearance, her parents received a haunting call stating that Brianna was being cowed against her will by local drug dealers. On the 15th of April, police raided a farmhouse in Berkshire, 15 miles from where she was last seen, and were given permission to search the residence. While they found no sign of Brianna, they did find crack cocaine, marijuana, drug trafficking items and two handguns. Four people that were in the house were questioned, with two of the occupants, Ramon Ryans and Nathaniel Jackson, admitting to knowing Brianna. Nathaniel admitted to seeing her a week before she disappeared, however both denied any knowledge of her disappearance. Neither men have ever been arrested in relation to Brianna's disappearance. Weeks turned into months, and quickly, months turned into years, with no new leads or information. Until the 17th of January 2006, when a woman at a poker table at Caesars Palace in Atlantic City was spotted, who looked a lot like Brianna. While Kelly desperately wanted it to be her daughter, she couldn't be be sure, noting that the body language was similar and the woman had long dark hair and was slim built, just like Brianna. Police attempted to locate the woman, who was believed to be from out of town, however had no luck in finding her. As the footage was grainy and from an awkward angle, a media agency cleaned it up and Kelly knew instantly this wasn't Brianna. On the 1st of February 2007, a Vermont newspaper published an article stating that a police officer had been given a sworn statement by a local woman who told him that Brianna had been murdered and dismembered by Ramon Ryans. In the statement, the witness talks about the disposal of Brianna's body. However, police have never been able to substantiate this information or corroborate these claims, and police have since said that the individual who provided the information wasn't necessarily trustworthy. Police are now back at square one. If she was still alive, my automatic thoughts go back to the possibility of a drug ring. Maybe she had to Shauna work in some LaBelle kind of sex slave ring to alive, pay off debt. She is not safe. Police suspect foul play. However, as it's an ongoing investigation, they're keeping their cards close to their chest, stating they have physical evidence from Brianna's car, but refuse to reveal what that physical evidence is. In September 2020, Vermont State Police partnered with Othram, a private DNA laboratory built specifically to examine forensic evidence, who will analyse DNA discovered during the investigation in the hope it will generate new leads. At the time of recording this episode, in February 2021, Brianna would be 34 years old. At the time of her disappearance, she was 17 years old and described as having brown hair and hazel eyes. She was between 5 foot 3 and 5 foot 5 inches tall, weighed roughly 105 to 118 pounds, with a nose piercing in which she wore a small ring or stud. Brianna had a faint scar through her left eyebrow and up to her forehead, wore contact lenses and took medication for chronic migraines, both of which were left behind in the vehicle. A $20,000 reward is offered for information that will lead to the identification of Brianna's whereabouts. If you have any information relating to her disappearance, you are urged to contact Vermont Police on 802-524-5993.
thank you for listening. Don't forget to head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a rating and review and Patreon to consider becoming a patron of Murder and More. As a patron, for just for just $2 a month, you get access to episodes early and ad-free, and you get a sticker sent to you. The link to my Patreon can be found in my show notes. To interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod, and Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. To view the sources and pictures for this episode, head over to www.murderandmorepodcast.wordpress.com. Have an amazing few weeks, stay safe, and I'll see you all in two weeks for another episode. Good evening, friends. I'm Emma, the host of the True Crime Witch podcast. Join me every other week as we delve into everything murderous, mysterious, and downright macabre. You can find the podcast by searching the True Crime Witch podcast on all of your favourite podcast apps and search for us on social media just using the True Crime Witch. Hope to see you there. Remember, friends, stay safe and stay spooky.